Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. One of the reasons that a person comes to faith in the Messiah, that is that he accepts the gospel, is because he wants to do the right thing. And when a person knows what the right thing is and has no intention of doing it, no desire to obey the truth of God, then that person is not part of the family of God. Now, we all struggle with doing the right thing. There is temptation, there is weakness, but a true believer, having been redeemed by the grace of God, through faith in the all-sufficient work of Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus Christ upon that cross, when a person comes to faith, he desires to be pleasing to God. And again, if one has no such desire, but only want the benefits of God, but not fulfilling the responsibility that God has given to us in his word, that person is a false believer. Why do I say that? Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 21. The book of Matthew and chapter 21. Now, here, Messiah, he has been interacting with the leaders of Israel, a portion of them. He has discussed certain things. There has been conflict. And now, once again, he is going to share with them a parable. And frequently, I pointed out a parable from the Hebrew language. That word parable means a teaching that is derived from that word parable is derived from the word for government, that which rules over authority. And what we see here in the parables of Messiah is truth from God that should rule our life, that we need to understand here are words of authority that we need to demonstrate and implement into our life. So let's begin. Matthew chapter 21 and we're going to begin in verse 33. Another parable you hear. And once again, Messiah is speaking. He's addressing a crowd, but primarily, and we'll see this at the end of our study, primarily this parable is for leaders, the leaders of Israel. All of them? No. Those who have taken a wrong position. Those who have set themselves against the truth of God, against his purposes. And this word for hear, when he says, you hear, he is desiring a change for them, a proper response. And here's a biblical truth. When we hear the word of God, that truth should bring about change in our life. We should constantly be conforming more and more to the will of God. That is what growth, maturity, growing spiritually is all about. So we read here, another parable you hear. And now the parable. A certain man was, and the next word means to be a lord over, a master of, an owner of, an estate. So this man has authority, and he has some assets, much assets. He is a ruler, and notice what he does. He plants a vineyard, and a fence he sets around it. He digs in it a wine vat, and also he built a tower. And then, finally, it says... And he leased it to vineyard owners. 
and he departed. Now, this word for departed means he went on a journey, and most scholars see that this word implies that he went a great distance. And it's obvious he put everything in action. He built this vineyard, he supplied it well, and then he leased it out to, and pay attention to this, individuals who were vineyard workers. He chose right people based upon their qualifications, their, their talents, their history, their profession. This was fitting. So it's not a problem, his choice, but these vineyard workers, they were not men of, of honesty. They were not upright. They did not submit to their obligations. See, a person who is a true believer, that person wants to be faithful. Now, faith involves many things, but one aspect of faith is desiring. Faith will cause us to desire, to want to be a person of loyalty, one that is trustworthy, one that speaks and acts according to his words. But these individuals, they did not. We're going to see that these were faithless vineyard workers. Verse 34. But when the season of the fruits, meaning harvest time, when the season or the time of the fruits arrived, this, this master of the estate, we read that he sent his servants to the vineyard workers. Why? Well, remember, there was an agreement. He leased out this vineyard. They, they would work his vineyard, and obviously, at the time of the harvest, they would share the, the proceeds from the fruits that were produced. So it says he sent, middle of verse 34, he sent his servants to the vineyard workers to receive his fruits. But notice what happened. Instead of fulfilling the agreement, being people who were upright, those who made an agreement and honored that agreement, instead of that, we read in the end of verse or the beginning of verse 35. And after taking, who's this? These vineyard workers. After taking his servants, we read that, that one they beat, but another they killed, and still another they stoned. Now think of this. These individuals, they had made an agreement. They got the ability in order to serve the master. And in the end, their work would produce a reward for them. The key word here is fruit. They were called to produce fruit. But what did they do? They had no intention of honoring this agreement. They did not want to be useful. They did not want to be a benefit to the Lord of this estate. But rather, they wanted to exploit this relationship. Why? For their own selfishness. They wanted what they wanted, and they had no concern, no thoughts for the expectations of this master of the vineyard. So when he sent the servants, notice how they acted. They just didn't say no, but they beat a man and presumably beat him severely. Another they killed and another they stoned and presumably stoned to death. Verse 36. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. And these vineyard workers, we read, and they did to them likewise. Finally, look now to verse 37. I say, finally, because this vineyard master, he is going to take a very significant action. He is going to send, notice what the text says, his very son. And we read here, but afterwards, he sent to them 
his son, saying, they will honor my son. Now, we're going to see that in this parable, the, the master of the vineyard, this one relates to God. And there's something that we need to learn about parables. Parables are big picture messages. We cannot take a biblical parable and extend every aspect to this parable in a very, very dogmatic way. The reason why I say this, what does God know? God knows everything. Does God ever make a mistake? He does not. He knows all, and he behaves perfectly. But here, in this parable, for the purpose of illustrating the behavior, the mindset, the, the attitude of these vineyard workers, what did they do? Well, he says, I will send to them my son. And the implication is, certainly, they will respect him, honor him. They will respond properly. But we're going to find they did no such thing. Now, again, in reality, God knows everything. But in this parable, it is to show how their behavior was so shocking, so improper. So we read, my son, they will honor. Verse 38, but the vineyard workers after seeing, and there's a change here. It is not the word blepo for normally perceiving, seeing something. But this is a different Greek word, which means not just to see, but to see with understanding, to have a proper perspective. They knew very well who this one was. And we're to see that undeniably. Once more, verse 38. But the vineyard workers, seeing the son, said among themselves, this is the heir. They understood. He's the one who eventually this vineyard's going to belong to. And they said, come, let us kill him, and we will seize. Now, this is a word for having. Now, many times I point out to you that there are two primary Greek New Testaments that, that we have. And one, for example, the King James is based off of, and, and most other translations base their text on a different one, and I feel a very inferior one. But we see some minor differences here. In the, the other Greek texts, it simply says, that they will have the inheritance. But in the Texas Receptus, there is a word, it's the same root, but it has a prefix added onto it. And this means to have something, but the nuance is to do so with a purpose, to do so in a secure way. In other words, they believe something. They believe that if they kill this heir, that they will secure for themselves what they want, what they have in their possession right now. They're at the vineyard, and they want the vineyard, and they're willing to kill the master's son for it. So they killed him, and they seized with purpose, with understanding, with intent, his inheritance. Verse 39. And after taking him, they cast him outside. Now, again, to show their, their disdain, their total rejection of this heir, the son of the Lord, what did they do? Well, if we read carefully, this word for casting, it's literally to cast out. And then we have the word outside. It is to show a total and absolute rejection of. So we read, and after taking him, they cast him out outside the vineyard. And now we have the phrase, they killed 
So we have that clarity. They put him to death. Verse 34, verse 40. Therefore, now we're coming to the conclusion of the matter. Therefore, whenever the Lord of the vineyard. Now, realize something. In the scripture, we see that, for example, in prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 5, Israel is likened to a vineyard. We know that, that in several ways, the scripture speaks about Israel as an instrument that is call, called to produce fruit. Sometimes a vineyard, sometimes a fig tree, but the key here is when we look at this passage, this parable, the vineyard relates to Israel. And therefore, when we read the Lord or the master of the vineyard, what does this do? This shows a close and inherent relationship between the Lord and obviously in this parable we're speaking about God. We see a close relationship between the living God, the one true God, the only God, and Israel. That is how this parable identifies God, the master of the vineyard. So it's very problematic when someone looks at this text and what is said in a few minutes, what we're going to read and study, and they come to a conclusion as much in Christianity has. And to say, well, this parable is about God severing his relationship with Israel. This is something that is prophetically incorrect. When you read prophecy, and I'm speaking about biblical prophecy, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the other prophets, what's usually referred to as the minor prophets, we see repeatedly, we see consistently, we see eternally that God is not going to cast aside his people. There will be a remnant of Israel. And what we're going to see in a few weeks is that until that remnant in the last days proclaims in a loud voice, blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. That is a phrase from the Psalms concerning the coming of Messiah. And when Israel, this remnant of the last days, proclaim this, what's going to happen? When they say that, and why is Israel going to say that? because they're going to be looking for Messiah. They're going to be in the midst of the worst time of trouble, what the Bible calls in Jeremiah chapter 30, a time of trouble, a time of, of tribulation for Jacob. And it's going to be in the midst of these very difficult times. In fact, biblically, the most difficult time for Israel that they're going to desire the Messiah, recognizing he's the Savior, that he's the only one, only that promise of a coming righteous king that is going to defeat the enemies of Israel. Only he can save them at this time. And they're going to turn in hope and expectation and believing the promises of God. And what's going to happen? Messiah is going to come. This is his second coming at the end of the age. And he's going to deliver Israel. And it's only when that happens that the kingdom of God is going to be established. So God does not deny his relationship with the Jewish people. He does not sever ties with Israel. One who says that is prophetically Incorrect. He does not understand prophetic revelation. And we're going to prove that in a moment. So notice again, verse 40. Therefore, whenever shall come the Lord of the vineyard, what will he do to those vineyard workers? Verse 41. They say to him, now this is the crowd. Those who are listening to this parable, 
They say to him, and I like this next phrase. Many Bibles translate it differently, but it's the same word in two grammatical different constructions. It's the word kakos, which is a word for evil. The first time it's announced, so it's evil ones. And then that word appears again in a different form, but same word as an adjective. So it says, evil, evildoers. Those who are really exceptionally bad. Why? Because they're not interested in the will of God. You need to ask yourself, are you interested in the will of God? The reason why you accepted the gospel, is it so that you will be a new creation, receive the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, so that you can know the truth, and here's the key, and be able to perform, do the truth. Now again, we're not saved by our performance. We're not saved by doing something. We're saved freely by the grace of God through faith in what he did. But here's the key. After being saved by grace through faith, one who truly is regenerated, they're going to think, the Bible affirms this in many different places, they're going to think differently. And they're going to desire God's will. Their utmost passionate desire is to obey the things of God. These ones did not. And what were they called? Evil, evil doers. So what will the Lord of the vineyard do? Look at the middle of verse 41. And he will kill them and the vineyard. He will lease to other vineyard workers. So he's not making a change in his plan. He originally wanted this vineyard to be worked on by vineyard workers. But now he's choosing other vineyard workers. And how should we understand that? Should we, as many within Christianity does, simply reject Israel, saying that, and there's a theology, a theology that's from the pit of hell called replacement theology that teaches that God has replaced Israel. That, that that covenant, God's obligations, his promises, what he said, are no longer valid. That is heresy. The word of God is eternal. It is not going to fail. God's will will be established. So he's going to lease out this vineyard to other vineyard workers who, in the verse 41, who will give to him the fruit in, in their seasons. Meaning it's in the plural saying in a repetitive way. Each and every time they're going to do and offer up to God what God desires. Verse 42, Yeshua says to them, and this is so important, because we see this always. He always turns to the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, in order for us to have a proper understanding of what he said. Everything that he did, everything that he taught was based upon Scripture. So he says, have you not read in the Scripture? And he quotes from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. He says, the stone which the builders have rejected, this one has become the chief quarter, meaning the foundation. And what's it speaking of? The foundation for the purpose, the will, ultimately the kingdom of God. And it's interesting because Judaism understands, Rashi taught this, this famed rabbinical commentator from a thousand years ago, that this stone is indeed the Messiah. So once again, he says, have you not read in the scripture the stone which the builders have rejected? This one has been made for the chief corner. It is from the Lord, this is, and it is marvelous in, and hear this, in our eyes. 
Now, I believe that this is a reference in the plural our eyes to perhaps the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Perhaps it's speaking about our eyes from, from the heavenly courts, but it's interesting that it says in our eyes. On account of this, verse 43, on account of this, I say to you that, that the kingdom of God shall be taken up from you. Who's he speaking to? Israel? No. We're going to see undeniably when he says you, he's talking about those rulers, those individuals who have no desire to fulfill the purposes of God, not interested in the will of God. So he says, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to, and here's the next word. It is the Greek word from ethos, nation. Now, if we were translating this into Hebrew from Greek, it would be the Hebrew word goy. And why is that so important? Because prophetically, and this is so vital that you see this. See, normally people hear the term goy and think of a non-Jew. But when we read in the book of Genesis, that wonderful covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, what does God say to Abraham? That you will become a great goy. And this is what it's referring to. And prophetically, when we read in the prophets, when Israel gets right with God, when Israel repents and accepts the truth of God, they're called a goy in relationship to this Abrahamic promise that tells us the blessing's going to come. So he says, and it will be taken from you and given to another nation that does fruit makes its fruit and then he finally closes with a prophetic statement the one who falls upon this stone will be broken and upon whom the stone falls upon will become dust and the pharisees and the high priest having heard the parable his parable they knew concerning him that he had spoken and what did they want to do well notice it was about them not the Jewish people, not the nation of Israel, but about these unrighteous, ungodly individuals not interested in the will of God. He says, they knew that it was about them that he spoke this parable, and they were seeking him to seize, to grasp him, but they didn't. Why? Because fear of the crowd, because they held him, everyone held him, meaning Messiah, as a prophet, a true prophet. Shalom. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week. May the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.